Pre-6 is actually not a lesson in our algebra book. It's actually lessons from chapter 16 of your accelerated red book. But a lot of times kids don't remember or they never got to chapter 16. So we incorporate this lesson so that way you can be successful in chapter 6 because you need some skills from that chapter in this um, chapter 6. So the first thing that we talk about are these things called radical expressions. And you can add or subtract radical expressions just like you would add 5x plus 4x equals 9x. And then you say, what the heck is a radical expression? Up until now, you've called this symbol a square root sign. But now we're actually going to call it a radical sign. And now my joke on the side makes a little more sense. Feel free to laugh at any time. Um, so we call it a radical sign, and it's used to represent the positive square root. So if, for example, the square root of 16 is 4, but then when we incorporate a negative sign in front, then we talk about the negative square root of 16 or negative radical 16, which would be negative 4. So unless you're told to put both, even though negative 4 times negative 4 is also 16, when you see this symbol, it only means to write the positive version. If you see this symbol, then they want the negative version. Now just a bit of vocabulary, the number under the radical sign is called the radicand. So the way that you add radical expressions is just like how you would add variables. So treat the radical as you would treat a variable. It's not a variable, but it operates the same way when you're adding and subtracting. So 5 radical 2 plus 4 radical 2 is going to be 9 radical 2, just like 5x plus 4x equals 9x. All right, if you want to pause the video and try A, B, C, D, and E on your own, feel free. If not, follow along with me. 2 radical 3 minus 7 radical 3. 2 minus 7 is negative 5, so that's going to be negative 5 radical 3. This is just like x plus x, so if it helps, put 1 radical 5 plus 1 radical 5. So that's 2 radical 5. You don't add the radicals. You keep them just like you would keep a variable. 6 radical 10 plus 4 radical 10 is 10 radical 10. And 2 radical 7 minus 1 radical 7 is 1 radical 7. But just like we would treat that uh, with variables, 1x is better written as x. So 1 radical 7 is better written as radical 7. Now, just because you see a radical doesn't mean that you can't reduce it. Um, in a moment, we're going to talk about simplifying radicals. But sometimes you can simplify radicals and you can get rid of them. So if you look over on the side, it says, don't assume that radicals that have different radicands cannot be simplified. So for example, 2 radical 4 plus radical 1 is 2 times 2 plus 1 because radical 4 or the square root of 4 is 2 and the square root of 1 is 1. So you should always look to see if you can reduce them. Now, not all radicals can be reduced like that example we were just looking at. So in a moment, we're going to look at how to reduce radicals that don't have friendly radicands. Um, but in order to do that, you have to be familiar with the perfect squares. So hopefully you remember perfect squares from when you learned about square root symbols for the first time. Perfect squares are the squares of integers. So for example, 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25. Can you bring this list all the way out, pause the video, and finish the list all the way up to 15 squared? Now, most of our examples aren't going to deal with the larger perfect squares. We're mostly going to deal with maybe the numbers uh, 1 through 100. But you should be able to recreate this list. You shouldn't have to memorize it. You should just be able to recreate it. So just like I did, you say, what is 1 times 1? What is 2 times 2? What is 
three times three? What is four times four? And you create the list on your own. You don't have to memorize it, but you have to know where it comes from. Now, the reason that we want the perfect squares is because if you look at that example we were just looking at where it said two radical four plus radical one, both of those numbers are on the list, and so they can be reduced. But if you look down at the examples below, not all of these, whoops, not all of these ha are the perfect squares. And so they can be reduced in a way, but not actually calculated to a uh, integer value. So let's look at how we would simplify things like example, like the questions in example two. So in order to do, the, to do that, we're going to use this thing called the product property. And the product property goes a little something like this. If you have two numbers being multiplied under a radical sign, so let's say x times y, you can break that up and say it's the square root of x times the square root of y. And you'll notice I'm using the words square root and radical interchangeably, just it's whatever's coming out of my mouth. It doesn't necessarily mean one over the other. But anyway, so you can take these two um, expressions and multiply them by pulling them apart. In terms of numbers, what that would mean would be if I had the square root of 12, which is not on the list of perfect squares that we've created up above, so that tells us that its square root is not a perfect integer. But I can still reduce it. I can still calculate it or, or simplify it in a way. So if you think of what number from this list goes into 12, 4 goes into 12. The first thing you always want to look for is a number on the list that is a factor of your radicand. So I'm going to rewrite this as the square root of 4 times 3 because that's what you get if you want to make 12. Well, I could rewrite that as the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And you say, how does that really help you at all? And I picked 4 intentionally because the square root of 4 is the number 2. So radical 12 is 2 radical 3. And although that doesn't necessarily look simpler to you, it is. Just in the same way that 3 over 6 doesn't necessarily look simpler than 1 over 2 when you were first learning how to reduce fractions, but 2 radical 3 is actually a simpler form of radical 12. And just like with fractions, you should always reduce your radicals. All right, so let's do the ones in example two. And at any moment, if you want to pause and try these on your own, feel free. Remember, you're always looking for a number from the list of perfect squares that goes into your radicand. So let's do example A. Square root of 50 has the perfect square 25 inside of it. So you want to look for preferably the largest perfect square that goes in. So I'm going to use 25. And that is the square root of 25 times 2. That's another way of saying 50. So I can rewrite that as the square root of 25 times the square root of 2. And the reason I picked 25 was because the square root of 25 is the number 5. So 5 radical 2 is going to be the simplification of radical 50. All right, let's check out radical 24. So radical 24, uh, let's see, on the list, hmm, 4 goes into it, and that's the biggest, so I will use it. Um, so I can rewrite this as radical 4 times 6, and I can break that up and say that's radical 4 times radical 6. And I picked 4 because it was on the list, because the square root of 4 is the number 2. So that's the answer to radical 6. All right, let's check out C. If you look at the list, 9 is the largest perfect square that goes into 45. So I'm just going to skip that first step and just say that this would be the radical of 9, square root of 9, times the square root of 5. So I'm skipping that first step where I write them together because I know eventually I'm going to break them apart. Square root of 9 is the number 3, so 3 radical 5 is the answer to what is radical 45 simplified. All right, last one in this section, radical 98. So you got to think for a little minute, and radical 98 has 49 inside of it. It's 49 times 2. And you always want to look for a number from the list that goes into the radicand. 
So I'm going to write this as the square root of 49 times the square root of 2. And I picked 49 because it's on the list because it has a square root of 7. So 7 radical 2 is my simplified answer. So just like the product property, you can also use a quotient property. So quotient would have to do with division, whereas product would have to do with multiplication. So here's an example. If algebra language, if you have the square root of x over y all underneath the radical, you can split that up and say it's the square root of x divided by the square root of y. Here's how that's helpful. If you have the square root of, let's say, um, 16 over 25, you can say that's equal, instead of getting a calculator and you know hoping that you type it in correctly, you can say that's equal to the square root of 16 over the square root of 25. The square root of 16 is 4, the square root of 25 is 5, and so that is the answer to radical 16 over 25. You don't need a calculator. Now, in my example that I just did, both of the radicals reduced, but they don't always both reduce, but one of them should if your goal is to use the quotient property. So let's check out example 3a. I'm going to use the quotient property, and I recognize that it's the quotient property because it's division, and quotient has to do with division. So I'll split this up and say that's the square root of 11 divided by the square root of 16. Now, the square root of 11 doesn't reduce. Uh, the square root of 16 does, and it reduces to 4. Now, what you should do before you circle your answer is you should check to see if there's anything from the list up top that goes into 11, and there isn't. So I'm actually going to leave it radical 11 over 4, and that's as low as I'm going to go. I'm not going to turn it into a decimal, and I can't do anything else. Let's try example B. So let's split it up. We can say this is square root of 35 over the square root of 36. Square root of 35 doesn't uh, go into an integer, uh, but the square root of 36 is 6. And 35, is there anything on the list that goes into 35? Uh, no, there is not, so it stays radical 35. Sometimes it does reduce, sometimes it doesn't. All right, let's try these. Uh, letter C. So this becomes the square root of 13 over the square root of 4. Square root of 4 is the number 2, and radical 13 does not um, reduce, so it stays radical 13 over 2. I'll show you some examples in class where it does reduce, but none of these are. And the last one is a little tricky because it's got some variables involved, but let's see what happens. So I'm going to break it up and say that's the square root of 5 over the square root of b squared. So if I say, let me just go to the side for a second, square root of 36 is 6 because 6 times 6 equals 36. So what times itself is b squared? It's b, right? b times b is b squared. So this becomes radical 5 over b. Um, just I'm sorry, that looks like a 6. It's supposed to be a b. So this is the simplified version. You don't really do a lot with the variables until you get to high school, but I want you to at least understand that variables can also have a perfect square. The last section that you don't necessarily get to or remember from chapter 16 is a section about negative and zero exponents. And we will use these very heavily in this chapter. So you really have to be able to calculate things with negative and zero exponents, especially negative exponents. So pause the video, take a minute, and read this key idea, and then we'll do the examples underneath. Okay, so last section, let's check out these examples. And remember from what you just read that negative exponents really have nothing to do with negative numbers and zero exponents have nothing to do with zero. Um, negative exponents mean that you're talking about the reciprocal. So you want to look for the base and then you're going to do the reciprocal of the base. So in this example, the base was 3, and so the negative exponent meant that they had to do the reciprocal of 3, which is 1 over 3, right, because 3 over 1. They flipped it, and then they raised that to the regular fourth power. So here's how it works. 
2 to the negative fifth. Well, 2 is the base, so if I turn that into a fraction, then I do the reciprocal, I get 1 over 2. And I'm going to raise that to the fifth power. Now, fractions and negatives should always go in parentheses, and I'll explain why in a moment when we get to example B. But you should always put fractions and negatives inside parentheses unless otherwise told. So this would be 1 to the fifth over 2 to the fifth. Well, 1 to the fifth is just 1, and 2 to the fifth is 32. So the directions wanted us to simplify, which is that. And then they also want us to evaluate, which is that. So we're not going to type this in our calculator and get a decimal. We're going to use our fraction knowledge. All right, now in example B, here's why negatives have to be put in parentheses. You have to look for order of operations. And order of operations, remember PEMDAS. And if you keep an eye on PEMDAS, exponents come before multiplication. This might be one, something you want to annotate because letter B is not telling you negative 5 is the base. Because there's no parentheses, exponents would come first and then you multiply by negative 1. This is just like saying negative 1 times 5 to the negative 2. I know it doesn't look like it, but what you would think um, would be that would be negative 5 to the negative 2 like that. So it's very different. They mean completely different things. So what I want to do is I want to ignore this negative 1 for right now and I will do the negative exponent and then I'll multiply by negative 1. So 5 over negative 2 would be 1 fifth to the regular 2 and that becomes 1 over 25 because 5 times 5 is 25 and then if I multiply by negative 1 I will get negative 1 over 25. So that would be my final answer. Letter C, remember, negative exponents mean do the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of 1 over 6 is 6 over 1 or just 6. And then I'm going to raise that to the third. Now I don't need parentheses here because I don't have a fraction anymore. Um, so this is the first part of the answer. And then 6 to the 3rd is 216. Oh, I forgot to circle my two parts in letter B. There we go. All right, now in letter D, anything to the 0 power is 1. So there's nothing for me to do. The answer is 1. But you can't get, you know, so happy and think anytime you see a 0 exponent, it's 1. Because if you look at example E, you have to follow order of operation. So PEMDAS here as well. So PEMDAS, tell you, PEMDAS tells you that you have to do parentheses first. So 3 to the 0 is 1, and then 2 times 1 is 2. So please be careful about order of operations. It's not always 1. Now this was a lot of stuff because it's pretty much the entire chapter 16 from your red book put into one little lesson. So we'll work a little bit on this, and then once you're ready, then we can move on to the official Algebra Chapter 6. And just like always, if you have any questions, write them down and ask me when you come to class.